Thank you everyone for joining Customizing Discussion Panel on Zoom with Eshta Amar, Tamlin Dalal, Darren Ho, and myself. So I forgot to press record on the actual live video for the beginning part. So I'm just going to go over my presentation and the stuff that um, I missed in the beginning. Okay, so I was talking in the beginning about how certain designers, when they, when they design for plus size bodies, they're trying to make us look as slim and as long as possible, um, but not necessarily keeping in mind to the fact that we are actually ordering or wearing dance costumes. And by, by that, I mean that they don't highlight, for example, uh, my hips. I don't have very big hips, so I actually like costumes that highlight my hips so that you can see the movements. Um, this partic particular costume here is by Hala Mustafa. Uh, she used to, she's an American designer, but she used to live in Cairo for decades, maybe like 20 or 30 years. And it's um, made from Tula Bitelli, which is a, a suit, uh, a suit fabric. And it's really beautiful, and I really love this dress. It's made from three panels of a suit. And a suit is kind of hard to um, design with because the, the tulle fabric is will warp and stretch. Um, but I don't wear this dress very often because it doesn't highlight my hips. And the, the fabric is so stretchy and so loose that it hangs and it's kind of too big for me. So I, I look like I'm wearing a sack. So you any movement that I make on my hips, can't see them at all. So it's really unfortunate because I really love this, this dress. Okay, the next design here is by Hisham Osman. He's a, a fashion a costume designer in Cairo. And he works exclusively in crystals. So he made me this dress. On the left here, you can see that um, it's just plain. I didn't add anything to it. Also, again, the vertical lines. He loves to make, he wants to make me look slimmer. So he's trying to, you know, highlight the vertical lines here. A little bit of hip highlight on the left here. But it's still not enough because my shape, you know, I don't have hips. So the hip to waist ratio doesn't help people see the movements. So what I did on the right here is I started dance, I started the show with a veil. I did a veil number and after that finished I tied the veil around my hips and finished with a drum solo. So I feel like this is a, an acceptable solution to the problem <laughs> but it would be better if, if he had to add some something around my hips to make it more obvious so that my movements are bigger. Okay so this is um, a, a dress that I really love. It's um, by Iman Zaki and it's very light. So it's made from tulle. Um, this is actually a purple color, but maybe the, the camera lighting isn't that great. But it's a purple color and she basically has appliques here all around and she did it as asymmetrically with little crystals all over. It's, um, I love this dress, it's very easy to wear. It, I wish that, because same with tulle, that it doesn't hug the body that well, it skims the surface. So it is a little bit hard to see my movements but not as bad as with the with the, um, with the, a suit fabric in the beginning. And I love these long sleeves. I feel like with the long sleeves, it, it, it gives a little bit of elegance and old time, old world glamour. So I wear this a lot if I'm dancing golden era style or uh, something that's very classic. So this costume I, I actually ordered from Madame Musa in Cairo. Uh, I have ordered other costumes from her before and I find her work really nice. She has a very um, heavy beading, very lo lots of embroidery on her work and it's, it really suits me well. Um, I love the fact that in almost all of her designs she always adds this hip scarf, hips, hip um, uh, accessory on my hips so it highlights my, my hips and my movements much better. Um, I actually gave her this design because I wanted it specifically like this. I asked her to add this cowl neck, um, sort of like a draped cowl neck underneath my, my chest, underneath the bra. So it covers uh, up my, my stomach, which I'm not very happy with. And it creates um, a sort of illusion that, you know, that I think makes it look quite nice. Um, and I feel very comfortable in this costume and I think that it, it hides, um, hides and highlights my body shape quite well. So I really like this costume. I think that it, it highlights my, um, 
my plus points and downplays what what I'm not um, comfortable with. Um, and plus the the highlight of the, sorry the contrast between the black and the red is um, is nice for me. I, I like that. Okay, this is another costume that I designed. I took the idea of the cow neck. <laughs> and I love this glitter black fabric. I got this made locally with a with a with a tailor here in Jakarta. Um, it wasn't very expensive to make, but she did a good job. She made uh she made the silhouette not too tight on me because when it's too tight, then um, it hugs. I feel like all the wrong places on my body, so it just fits just nice on my body, and with the extra fabric in front and the uh, the nice uh, covered bra. I think that it did. A, it looks. It looks really nice, and I'm very comfortable wearing this. Okay, troop costumes. So, <laughs> uh, I have uh, students, and not everybody is a. Pro you know, they're not professional, so they don't have. They don't want to invest that much money in costumes. So what I did is I ordered these bra and belts from from Egypt. And as you can see, all my dancers are different sizes. We have really tall, really short, uh, bigger and smaller. So all different. So I like this stomach covering here because in Indonesia, we're not that um, modern, I guess, or, you know, we, we like to be a little bit more conservative. So as much as they can, they want to cover their stomachs and not have too much booby, booby um, cleavage. A little bit is okay, but, you know, when it's like up here, then they get really uncomfortable. So I ordered the bra and belts from, from Egypt, and then we made the skirt locally. So... I love this kind of idea for troop costumes because the bra and belt or the bedla, um, you can just change or add it and change the skirt or even add a dress and then it looks like a completely different costume. Uh, this is the first one and then we added sleeves. So little uh, sleeves from, we just had little little buttons onto the bra strap and to the to the back of the, the bra and um, with this with the sleeve here and we changed the skirt and it it looks like a completely different costume, which is really cool, and it's very uh, budget friendly. Um, and then we did, I added this, um, so this is a two piece. It is a, is it called a mutton sleeve? No, dolman sleeve. So it's quite wide underneath the armpit. So it's on one side, and then it attaches to the skirt, and I made like a mini skirt because we were doing shabby. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So then uh, a little mini skirt, and we can take off the this the the top and add like a big fluffy skirt in the bottom and it looks like a, a regular belly dance costume again <laughs> yeah so these are just some ideas uh, and then we I had a big um, a big troop event and of course again with all these all different sizes this was for the British Women's Association charity ball they do it every year and this year their theme was uh, Aladdin or I don't know any Arabian Nights something like this. Um, so we I, I did um, a simple dress with cutouts in this gorgeous sequin fabric. Um, it's quite cheap here to buy, and I added um, uh, sorry I added uh, the hip scarf which is made from tulle, and she did uh, the dressmaker did a little bit of design on that. And this is um, what is it called removable. So we, we attached it to, to the dress, and then when we don't want it, we can take it off. This dress actually has a sleeve as well on one side uh, that I, I was planning to use for Andalusian dance, but we haven't done it yet. So it's supposed to be a long sleeve that, that hangs down the bottom when it's open up to the elbow, but I don't have any pictures of that yet. Uh, this one I think is really nice because all my girls were really comfortable wearing this. Uh, they showed a little bit of skin, but not too much, and it looks nice on bigger girls and smaller girls, too. So, yeah, <laughs> I think that as um, when you have a troop or when you're part of a troop, it's important to be sensitive to the girls who are not comfortable with their bodies or not comfortable with showing what their bodies are, uh, you know, so much of their skin. Um, so we try. I, I try as much as I can to change the costumes a bit so that everyone is comfortable and when they're comfortable they they usually dance better so that's it's win-win for everybody and oh, okay so this is um, uh, a ballet dress that uh, we got made here uh, with uh, blue velvet I used it for Shamadan because it's you know as folklore and we also used it for uh, as <laughs> also another ballet 
<laughs> with uh, pom pom head scarves from Egypt. And uh, yeah, this one was it's a really popular um, costume, especially during Ramadan time when um, it's more uh, conservative. So usually in Indonesia, when we have gigs, the they usually like us to, to cover our stomachs or even like wear long sleeve um, turtlenecks and then put the bra on top. Uh, I'm not sure I like that idea because, you know, you're still, it's not that conservative if you're still showcasing your bra and everything. So I always try to recommend them to wear this dress uh, for more conservative weddings or more conservative um, uh, events. And we will add like uh, leggings or something underneath. So then it's really fully covered um, and you don't see any cleavage, nothing, especially with the leggings. So we've done that a few times and yeah, it's, it's worked really well. I really like this, this costume. <laughs> This uh, this design is actually based on a design by Hanan Mahmoud, um, but because getting stuff from Egypt to here is kind of expensive, so we just took the design. Sorry, Hanan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and this is um, our Golden Era troop costume. So with Golden Era, I was trying to find something that was black and white, um, striped, but I couldn't find any fabric. So we just covered basically... Um, uh, what what's called strapless bra with this sequin black and white fabric and then did this these kind of straps that was popular in the day uh, in, in that era um, and because uh, I didn't want to add too many rhinestones or, or sequin because that's going to add to the cost so we just added a little bit of rhinestones on the on the on the strap and some beading and we added these these removable sleeves. So everybody, this sleeve idea I got from a dancer in um, in Australia. Her name is Rachel Bond, and she loves these sleeves. And she she made a pair for me. She's like, you know, go make them for your for your students. So I did, and they're removable, which is really cool because you can just wear them, and then when you want to dance something else, you can take them off, or you can just use them if it's a, a matching color with different um, costumes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, this is our shabby costume. Um, just we did some shabby and some balladie, and I didn't want to do a very um, traditional kind of galabea, so we made a funky kind of galabea with my girls. Uh, I just found the fabric here; it's just lycra with glitter on it, and everybody really loves this costume because it's really comfortable, <laughs> and you don't have to show any skin or anything, and so they liked it a lot. <laughs> Okay, this is the Tamalin dress, which Tamalin will talk about uh, later. But um, this is a really versatile uh, costume that I, I like to use with the with my girls. So we use it for almost anything. Um, I've used it for Andalusian uh, or Moasha, and I've also used it for uh, for Baladi. So with this dress, because it's convertible, I, I asked them to wear a bra and a and a belt, and then you can tie the um, the Tamil will show you. You can tie the, the dress up and, and show your bra and your belt off and everything. So it's very versatile. We love it. I love it so much, this dress. So this is also the Tamil dress and we added these robes. So um, my Mwashat or my, my interpretation of Mwashat, uh, sometimes I like to add robes. It just gives a different texture to the movements. And um, yeah, so that's, anyway. <laughs> okay, so this is a dancer from the Philippines. I just wanted to highlight. So she is um, not a professional teacher. I, th I don't think she's full-time. I think she's part-time teaching um, belly dance in Manila. She is older. She's, I think, 60-something, maybe. So, uh, and she's not, um, she doesn't have a lot to, in to invest in costumes. So she makes her own costumes. And I just wanted to show you how amazingly beautiful this woman is with such quote unquote simple costumes. Um, I just, I'm amazed. She, she, she made this really simple black dress with the slit up the side and she, she bought this um, here uh, on, the, on the edge. She bought some sequin uh, ribbon. So she didn't have to put everything one by one. So she bought some sequin ribbon and, and edged the sides. And then she added this beautiful I think it's rhinestone, stick on rhinestones or something like this and it's very simple but she looks so elegant and so lovely 
I really love her her ideas because compared to somebody okay so if you don't have a lot of money to spend on costumes I think it's always best to go simple rather than trying to buy something off the rack um, not off the rack sorry off Alibaba um, <laughs> you know and then it's like a, a hot mess because maybe the base isn't a, is a real bra so it's kind of flimsy you know and then maybe it doesn't fit you because a lot of these uh, costumes that you find on Alibaba from China are um, made for Asian women. So it's like cup B. It's a small B. It's not even a real B. It's a small B. And, you know, and you're trying to wear it and then it's going, it's, it's coming out here and it's coming out here and it's not, not really very nice to look at. And I think that this idea is much more beautiful. She had another costume. Ah, I love this. It's so simple. But she 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 added this um, pharaonic collar, which is just costume jewelry. It's not even um, something real or anything. It's just costume jewelry. She added the pharaonic collar. She's dancing baladi, and she made this white tunic tunic. I think it, yeah, I think it's called a tunic. A white tunic galabea thing, and how elegant and amazing does she look? It's really I really love it. It's um it's really beautiful. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So that's my um, <laughs> my um, uh, my costumes well, uh, for what I designed for my for my troop. What I choose for my troop, girls. Um, I think that it's like I said, it's important to to find out uh, everybody's com comfort level. I think that in other countries, many people are more open to showing their stomach or their um, cleavage, and it's fine. It's just over here, we're very um, we don't like doing that so much. You know, I have to convince them. I'm like, you don't have to wear the body net and whatever. They're like, yeah, but I gained two kilos. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> two kilos is like, what, five pounds? Which isn't that much. But, you know, they're like, oh, but you know, and this and this and that. So I'm like, okay, just let's just get a dress. That's fine. <laughs> okay, so um, are any of you ready? Tamlin, do you want to go? Because then you can just talk about Tamlin dress too. Yeah, I'm happy to to give my input. Okay, I have input about a lot of things. I was looking at the two-piece costumes, you know, when you were showing the dancers with two-piece costumes and how everything really fit them. It looked like it was made for their body. And a lot of times I, I have seen with students especially that the costumes are not quite fitting right especially some of the skirts that don't have a belt and they have that elastic and then their lycra and then the elastic starts getting older and accidents happen easily when you wear a two-piece costume like you see so much underwear you see you see a lot of things we really don't want to see right or the cups that are like sticking out and you see the padding you, um i've seen a lot of things like that so I feel that with the two-piece costume, um, either the teacher really has to supervise or um, the person wearing it has to be a real seasoned professional because otherwise the audience is distracted looking at the wrong things, looking like, oh my God, is something going to fall out or is something going to fall down? Um, because it often does. And so I'm giving my lecture about modesty first another thing i have seen is like the cutouts with the flesh colored mesh but like dancing and the cutouts slide over too much i saw a cutout that slid all the way to the front in a festival in china and there were a lot of egyptian dancers there and they were kind of like covering they're just like oh my god because it looked it made everybody nervous, you know, it's just totally distracting. So unless we can really carry off those costumes, like, why do we need them? Yeah. Um, I also see sometimes that, that people just follow a costume trend or think that this is what a costume is, so we have to do this no matter what our body type. And 
we have to really be careful of that because this dance already we're giving an image to the public about this dance it's not just ourselves that you know oh i like doing this i like wearing this i'll go out and wear it the public sees it and they either like or they don't like oriental dance they could be like oh i don't know i would never do this dance you know we have to keep our dignity and um we have all different types of bodies i can admit I've had some lifelong issues that I really try to dissimulate so that people don't see certain things that, you know, are not flattering. For example, this is true confession. I have like a huge surgical scar from, from a problem from childhood. And it makes one of my legs much bigger than the other. So some I've, I've had this even when I was a working dancer who was going around to the gigs and so forth. And in the 80s, what was popular is we would layer. We would have harem pants and layers of skirts and then panels. And of course, that was fantastic. And I've always been bigger on the hips, smaller on the shoulders, no matter if I was skinnier or heavier. So I had to augment the shoulders by like not having not having straps halter straps but having the straps out here back in the 80s i'd even put fringe here and then it balanced out the shoulders bigger and consequently more balanced with the hips so um i learned a lot of tricks and mostly i've been making my own costumes I now I do not wear two piece costumes. And the reason there's many reasons for that. One of them is when I wrote my book 40 days and a 1001 nights, those of you that know about it, it's a travel journal where I went to five different Muslim countries, it was at the height of Islamophobia in the United States, where people were where it was like the whole country after after 9-11, after we went over and started wars, the whole country was like, you know, Muslims are bad and then confused about everything. And so anybody in the turban was bad, even, and it was crazy ignorance, like we still have, yeah. But um, I decided to go over to different Muslim countries, write a book, that's how I met Christine in Indonesia. and not write a book as an expert in Islam, but write a book and like, am I finding terrorists? No terrorists here, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if I found them, I would have written it too. But anyway, aside from the book, I was spending a lot of time in people's homes with them, dancing with women as well. And um, it was like that very separated society in most countries that I went to. And Nobody, well, they weren't wearing costumes for one thing. They were wearing their regular clothes. Sometimes it was kaftans. I did notice, um, I actually learned a lot in Kenya, even though you would think Kenya, what does it have to do with Oriental dance? But there's a lot of Arabic influence on the, along the coast and a lot of Arabic people. One thing I learned there is that we might be dancing, let's say somebody takes off their abaya and they've got their jeans on and we're dancing. But then one moment, I remember a specific moment where this one woman just went and she got just a cotton robe, like kaftan type thing and tied one of the scarves around her hips and her dancing improved tremendously. And I looked at that and I'm like, that is, if you want to pare it down to what the costume for, for our dance is, that's what it is. You know, a robe, not, okay, not a bathrobe, a, um, a kaftan with a scarf tied on the hips. And of course we stylize it from that. So when I, I was going back and forth between traveling and living with people, you know, especially in a lot in East Africa, in different parts of 
Oh, she got it. She took it. Oh. Okay. So um, I was I was traveling and being among people. We we're dressed very modestly, and just every day on the street or in the wherever I went, I was dressed, you know, modestly up to here and so forth. And then when I was dancing, I was dressed modestly. I was going between that and teaching workshops, which at that time, it was very early on in the superstars days. I wasn't traveling with the superstars, but I was, I was teaching with the expectation of that look. So when I would perform, I'd put the two piece costume and I just felt really strange. So I kind of phased it out and felt more comfortable. I thought about what alternatives there are. Of course, we have belly dresses. We always had that. We've always had evening dresses, but at that point, the evening dresses were starting to be really cut out too and some, sometimes sexier than the two piece. So. I thought, okay, what one of my goals throughout all of that was to to offer something that can can change the perspective on a dance costume. And so my idea was to have a, an evening dress that could be doubled up as evening dress, dance costume, and also workout you know, for going to class and even for wearing during the day. And I, I hadn't thought of anything, but then one day it happened accidentally. And this is how we'll get to the Tamalin dress. Um, I was, okay, one thing I mentioned about my leg, I use asymmetric a lot, like lines or, or like, and one deep, more details on one side, less on another or an asymmetric hemline or different things that draw the eye in different directions. So you're not expecting to see something exactly symmetrical. And so I was going to dance in a festival in Zanzibar and I had to be covered, but I didn't want to wear a real belly dress because I was dancing to the musicians that I worked with on the CDs and and we were gonna we we're presenting the CD made in Zanzibar. It was mixed with Western classical music and Arabic and Zanzibari. So I was like, okay, I, I need to be covered, but I can't be belly. And so I can't, I remember there was a lady and this shirt, I believe started in Italy. The lady that, that sold me the shirt, she said she designed it. It's like the, kind of off the shoulder asymmetric shirt that is also cut at a diagonal and has one dolman sleeve and one non dolman and you can take the sleeves and tie them at the neck and she was selling them at an Italian belly dance festival I bought one no I bought two and I didn't really like them or understand them but Almost two years later, I had brought them on a trip around the United States with me and I started using them all the time because it was amazing. You could, you know, put the sleeves around your neck and you're sleeveless. You could, you know, you could be out and about and you're just like, okay, now I'm going to, you know, just put, I'm cold. I'm not going to wear a sweater. I'll just put the sleeves on my arms. And I would wear a sports bra underneath. So when I was doing that change, I was still covered. I could do that change in public. And then I was in China and I was like, I need to come up with something to wear in Zanzibar. And so I went to this lady who sold a lot of things with Jersey fabric or would make stuff. And I said, I, I had those shirts and I'm, I'm like, I need, these shirts and other colors and then i said i need a dress and then i laid the fabric on the floor i started drawing and cutting it and so it was just that top lengthened and still very asymmetrical 
kind of like the asymmetrical mini dress costume that, that Christine showed, that asymmetrical. And then we put like a, a semicircle into that. So the semicircle makes that side quite long. And that that's what would be the short side, but with the semicircle, it's now the long side. So um, it became like this amazing dress with the draping and the, it was like the most comfortable dress. So I wore it in Zanzibar. I fell in love with it. It was soft material, soft stretchy material. And I started just wearing it at like almost every show. I was traveling around the world and every show they hadn't seen the dress yet. So it, it wasn't as much internet as there is now, you know? And so I'd bring that blue dress with me and then I decided I wanted a black one and I was going to the Siwa Oasis quite a bit in Egypt and the ladies have a special style of embroidery. So my friend, she had a group of ladies that she would put together to embroider stuff for me. So I'm like, I want one of those dresses and to have her embroider it. So I had one made and it was in black and another one in like a off black with gold. And um, then my students in China, we needed a dress that everybody could be wearing the same thing, but in different colors. So I came up with a couple of other ideas. They, but then they saw my dress and they tried it on. And I was amazed how everybody really looked great. And so I, every, we called in the tailor. She made a different color for everybody. And that's what started it because they went back to their hometowns and they had the dresses made for their students and their schools. And this dress went viral in China. I don't know if anybody remembers, but it went viral in China. It became popular, I think, in, in the Czech Republic. A Russian dancer came to Miami. She was wearing it. Like, it just was everywhere. And it is one of the most comfortable and clever, versatile dresses out there, even though I really, I don't sell it. You know, I don't benefit from it other than the fact that I reached my, I accomplished this goal that I was trying to get at. You know, I was like, I want this kind of dress. And it happened just sort of by accident. Yeah. Um, do you have that picture, Christine? It's blue. One of them I sent you, I'm in the blue dress. Okay. Um, that's in the festival. And I used a belly dance bra. I put it under the bra and I crisscrossed it through the straps and I put a couple belts over it. It's probably not the most flattering picture of me, but oh well. <laughs> yeah, I should, I have another one that's much more flattering, but yeah. you know, the drapiness is something that because we're not showing our body, having that drapiness like Christine, you have in a couple of your dresses that shows so much movement now you can click on yes this one if you can open it yeah oh i think i, I think that there's an internet lag so i i've opened it on my end and it's shared already but i think oh, it's okay. getting to oh i see it here okay yeah so I was wearing it to dance Oriental that I believe is in a festival in Taiwan. And then there's another one, the one at the bottom. I guess I didn't wear it that often with the long sleeves, but on the bottom is you can see better, maybe the embroidery and stuff. That's the one from that I went to the Siwa Oasis. And I actually have quite a bit of stories, but I don't want to hog up all the time, but this was made in the Siwa, this was embroidered, made in China, embroidered in the Siwa Oasis by, um, by my friend during the Egyptian revolution. So I left it with her and um, then her son, she, they embroidered it and, oh, okay, from Magdalene, Tamalin is the dress jersey knit. It is very soft. Okay, how did the embroidery not pull the 
fabric and change the line. Oh my gosh, I'll tell you. Okay, the first time I brought something that was knit material jersey to her, she complained a lot. And I'm like, okay, I won't do that anymore. Well, no, I didn't say that. I just brought something else later. But no, you know what it was? Okay, she complained because her the women were just like, no, this we can't we're not familiar with doing traditional embroidery on on jersey knit fabric. But then later, this our relationship was for years. So then later she's like, you know what, I figured it out. We can do it. That's when I brought a dress from China. The minute she told me that, I'm like, okay, I'm bringing you a dress next time I come so that you can embroider it. And this has a lot of embroidery. She did amazing. And Bobby says, how did the embroidery not pull the fabric and change the line? I don't know, but she figured it out. Yeah. Um, I have and a then, uh -huh. I have a question. Is the Another... belt separate? Pardon? Is the belt separate? Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. That belt, it's a couple of panels that I bought because they sell a lot of the old, the clothes like that they're getting rid of in this. See what Oasis, they sell them in these little tourist shops and um they have little bits of embroidery and so forth so i bought a couple little panels and um then I, oh my god i must okay i would probably get in so much trouble if i told this story very in a very big way but at that time i was just looking for color coordination and back in the early 90s i used to travel around and and I used to buy things and it's like my souvenirs would become my costumes. So that was part of it with the panels. And then I went to a little shop in Seattle, a little Turkish shop. And the there's a round disc on the hip. It was a children's hat from Uzbekistan. And then I added like little necklaces. I think it was, um, you know, some of the Turkish jewelry that's not traditional that they sell you know it was like in the tourist places i added some of that and then i added some stones from the fabric store so it was really a mix of everything but yeah the i feel it's very 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 important to have a belt all the time a sash or a belt to show the movements yeah and i just wanted to really quickly mentioned the white one is um the one in white is like a golf party dress in zanzibar at the parties they wear these party dresses from the gulf of course the fashions change so this might be out of fashion but they don't tie anything on their hips they just wear them you know as their party dresses and when i was in zanzibar Westerners were considered very dull and very boring with no style whatsoever. And so when I would go to a party, a lot of times I'd put on a, an oriental dance skirt and then put a long shirt over it just to go out and go to a party to see a show or something because I didn't want to be that boring Westerner. But I saw this dress in a, in a shop, like in a dusty little shop, and I'm like, Oh my God, it stood out and I've been wearing it ever since. And I tie a little belt around it and I have worn it to dance in Zanzibar as well. And then the one down in the bottom, that's a chartreuse green, that one it's, yeah, it's a belly dress in chartreuse green. That is another just very plain daily wear caftan because I was going to an island in Zanzibar to film some some special Sufi based practices for my film and they said you need to be really covered and so I stopped at the market I got this one super comfortable I didn't have to worry about it ten dollars has a headscarf that goes with it I'm not wearing it there and got on a little boat and went to the island and and did my filming and everything and didn't offend anybody because I was completely covered. 
And then I have this still, I wear it as a costume. It's really lovely because of the colors. And I believe it was made in Indonesia. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I like I have other pictures and stuff, but I'd rather take questions because I could talk all day and nobody will get to talk. <laughs> the dress pattern available. Um, let's see. No, it was actually never really available in China. They just like, I was there just cutting away and measuring. And then they always take their sample. Like, let's say my students got these dresses. They took the sample to the tailor and the tailor makes their own pattern. And they often make modifications like Christine, you did a lot of modifications to the Tamalin dress for belly dance Jakarta. Like you'd added the slit. I know you did a few other things too to fit what you guys were doing. Yeah. Yeah, and also um, because and I got mine um, from the Czech Republic. Oh, okay. Yeah, it really migrated. I don't, yeah. how did it get to the Czech Republic? I think it was from Shireen because Shireen um, taught in China. Oh. So she brought one back and I think that they, that they um, got it. But you know that I'm really grateful that you gave me your blessing to, to make your dress, but I call it the Tamil oh. dress. <laughs> you know, I'm so much, ha okay, I'm happier to see it in coming out of Indonesia than, than on Taobao in China. Because, hmm. um, well, yeah, because yeah, it's kind of like, you know, they forgot completely about the source in, in Taobao because it became not the dancers, but commercialized manufacturers doing it. And um, they also cut the sleeves and made a little indentation so you can't tie the sleeves anymore. Yeah. yeah. I have mine long so, sleeves and I have a supplier, but she's not, um, I don't know what's happening to her now with the, with the coronavirus, but she's a single mom. So, and uh, so it's basically like a, her home garage workshop, something like this. So she was the one who was making and I know that some, some ladies were telling me that there were some problems with like the stretch of the fabric and everything, but it's really hard to, because of course it's not, uh, we're not a factory, so I can't order, you know, hundreds of kilos of the same fabric. Um, sometimes right. some fabric will have more stretch and some less stretch, but, but yeah, it was a great, I really love this dress. <laughs> I think most of my girls have like at least half a dozen in different colors. Oh, wow. Yeah. And for, for several years, every time I would teach a workshop in China, every workshop I'd come in and there'd be like so many people in Tamilin dresses. I'm like, wow, this is a mission accomplished, you know? <laughs> yeah, not because I wanted them to wear something that looked that I designed, but because I wanted, I wanted there to be exist a dress that, you know, had all the qualities I talked about. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, actually for plus size girls, I think it's really hard to find a uh, dance wear. I mean, which is one, one of the reasons why I start I started make pr producing these. You know, um, mm -hmm. like uh, was Sharif wear in the states, they have plus size wear, but it's always like m bearing the midriff, and I'm really really not comfortable doing that. Um, you know, they they make it up to like three XL or something like this, but it, it, I'm not comfortable, and I I don't like it. So I've never bought from them because they don't cater to other people's needs i guess and then you know they say okay wear a t-shirt underneath but then i just look like a egg roll mm, yeah one of the things and probably i want to pass it over to everybody else too because i want to hear everybody else but one problem is that um you know the two-piece costume you have so many horizontal lines horizontal line under the bra horizontal line at the belt and so the stomach is only this long and then you know unless you're shaped like Samia Gamal it doesn't do anything for you and it doesn't do anything for the dance like what how does it augment the movements it's like what there is no point oftentimes um you know we get started in the dance and it's like oh this is a stereotypical this is what you wear so you just wear it but I think everybody has to think things through independently and be like, is this what I want to wear? Is this actually 
looking good doesn't help my dance. And so I think like a longer line with something at the hips is better. And also last thing, hip to shoulder ratio. You know, I mentioned about my shoulders being smaller and adding. Some people's shoulders are bigger than their hips. They can add like little poofy things at the hips. Yeah, but we always have to try to, you know, balance and show off our movements and show off, you know, our, our good points. And of course, we have no bad points because we're blessed to have our bodies. But, you know, show off what's going to flatter our dance and our body and, and not, not just show off because you're expected to, to look like a stereotype. Yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> so if there aren't any questions, I'm just going to invite Eshta to start uh, her, start talking, basically. <laughs> I, I have a question, and maybe um, Eshta might be, because she's the costume designer, might be able to kind of address this in when, when she's talking. But like you, Christina, I have a true, I, I have a, a company that where there's all shapes and sizes. And like Tamlin just mentioned about trying to costume for your body to highlight the things that are good to create that nice line and shape. And then also the ideas of sometimes you need, um, I've kind of graduated a little bit more to more coverage as much as possible for a lot of things that we do, but sometimes you need to do something that has, a, um, you can tuck veils. Like if you want to do a veil tuck, um, and sometimes with the dresses and the belts over top, it doesn't always work really well. Um, so I don't know if that could be uh, something that someone might want to talk about because the two piece sometimes works better for certain style of dancing, whereas the dresses can work really well for, for other things or more coverage. Um, but maybe that could, maybe someone could talk about that. I can say something really briefly. You can have more tucks in the bra. I mean, like the veil choreography could tuck more in the bra and then the belt some belts even over the dresses are like heavy enough that you can tuck yeah i'm gonna hand it over to eshta i'm gonna mute okay myself. i unmuted myself so. <laughs> okay um i don't uh i definitely want to answer questions but i think I'm not even really entirely sure what to like lecture on. I just feel, I feel like we're at this weird point where uh, we have so much internet that's giving us so much, so many different views on what people are doing that um, things are really different now. So um, I feel like, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna, I wanna look at all your faces and not just mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like it's almost an economic problem. There's all this cheap costuming out there. It, it never really used to be that way, right? We go to a festival and you would spend, you know, all this money on something new that was made well, or you'd spend less money on something that was used, still made well. I handed down so many pharaonic dresses from one, you know me to the next person to the next to the next and sometimes back to me and they would always come back and be wearable and they were durable designs and now it's just flooded with like crap honestly like just really awful stuff bras that don't hold up and so people are always looking for like the hundred dollar fix so I feel like that's like we have to step back and decide that what we want to wear regardless of our size needs to be made well so that when we dance it holds up and so that we can make these kinds of alterations to our clothing um you know so that we have a good base to deal with because if you do want to make your own costumes or if you've inherited something and it's not made well in the first place you're never going to be able to add the features that you want or make the base dress to go under the bedla that maybe is you know falling apart so I feel like we're sort of stuck in this weird space where people want all of their personal body image problems to be solved by one costume that they want to pay a hundred dollars for. Do you know what I mean? So it's hard to kind of talk about how to solve that other than to just commit to 
um, you know, buying sustainable clothing from people, you know, that you know, or that are making them by hand, you know, find that designer in Egypt who's doing it herself or your local designer, or, you know, ask questions and try to avoid things that are glued together. You know, all these things are suddenly very important. They weren't important before. And now we're stuck with a flooded market of dubious things. So it's hard to find a costume in that market and then put on top of it the fact that like you can't even find anything in your size you know like i'm a solid like 16 18 it's just that's life like i can't i can't really change that i'm not really ever going to be able to change that like i'm a really short hobbit like i'm like five two and i'm a, so i have all these problems going on I'm, I'm a big girl and i'm short so i have nowhere for the stuff to go nowhere for the curves to be they're just here and it's really hard for me to be okay with that, but I've had to just, you know, that's my own personal struggle or whatever, but I have so many dancers who come to me and they're larger and they just, they want to cover this up. They want to cover that up. What they really want is a whole different body. And they think that I'm going to make them something that's going to give them a different body, but that's not how that works. So I always counsel them that like, you can't, like you can cover things up with a sheet of fabric but you're not really covering anything up everybody can see who you are what you look like what size you are so you have to be okay with that and then from that point you get to then come out and decide what is it that you want to accentuate or not accentuate but if you're not okay with what you're putting out there already then you're never going to find what you want to minimize and maximize if you know what i mean there's a lot of dancers who say, well, I don't want to, you know, I have rolls of fat and I don't want anybody to see them. So I clearly have to have a dress and it needs to be loose everywhere. And it's like, well, now you're wearing a sack. Like, <laughs> like you don't have to wear a sack. <laughs> you don't have to wear a tent on your body. You can wear something that, you know, skims your body that fits. You can have something that hugs your curves. Like, how is anybody going to see anything if it's not holding you together with the fabric and the, the whole thing? So it's hard to find people that can do that for sure, but it's also hard to make a choice with yourself about how you feel and what you want to show. Cause there's really no rules. Like there's no belly dance police that's going to tell you, you have to wear a bedla or whatever, you know, but if you're not, if you're not comfortable with yourself, then it's not nothing anybody puts you in is going to solve any of your problems. It might just make you feel better for a second. So it's good to try to come to it from that standpoint. Um, because if you don't, then you, you just won't. Like Tomlin had all these great ideas about how she thinks about her personal leg feelings and her shoulder size feelings and her hip size feelings and all of those things. And some people never even think about that. They just come to you like a, a bundle of body issues that you gotta sort out. So, so I always encourage everybody to try everything on, even if you think that it won't fit. And even if you think that the style is terrible, if you can go, like when I went to, to Egypt, I went with my buddy. Um, no one was watching us. No one was bothering us in the dressing room. I tried whatever I wanted on. Um, and things surprised me. I had no idea that I would look good in this particular style versus that particular style. I wouldn't have known if I didn't put it on my body. And it's okay to say, oh, I tried this on and it's terrible. And I'm never going to do that again. But what will you find? You know, you might find out something really nice. Um, so I encourage people to do that. Whenever you go shopping, try something on that's different just to see because you and your mind might be stopping yourself from discovering what can accentuate your body type. Like Tamla was talking a lot about caftans, which are fantastic. I cannot wear a caftan. I, there are, there's no caftan in the world for me. It's, it's sad, but I've made hundreds of them. I keep thinking I'm going to make one that's going to be great. I can't wear a caftan. I can't, I'm too short and wide. So it just looks like I'm a square. When I wear a caftan, I'm just like a walking Lego brick. And it's awful. I can't, it's no, I want to have the caftan in the robe and I want to lounge in my gorgeous caftan. No, 
It will not happen and it's fine. I've had to make peace with that. So what else can I wear that's like that? I've tried kimonos. There's like a type of Moroccan kind of belted kimono that I can do, you know? So I've had to try different styles. So just because you can't do one doesn't mean that you just stop forever. You kind of explore. So I guess um, when I was thinking about the images that you guys might like to see, I tried to pick primarily dresses that I sent to Christine and all of the things that I designed for myself because I've made so many hundreds of costumes, like I mean hun like hundreds of costumes. And I don't get to design for plus size dancers as much as I would like um, because I do get a lot of like, Oh, Christine is making some kind of gesture. <laughs> um, I can't hear you because you're muted. But um, I said that I'll, I'm going to order. <laughs> oh. I mean, I want to work with more plus size dancers, but that's hard because they require more fittings and now we can't get together because of coronavirus and everything. But I also get a lot of the, um, I get a lot of like skinny competition dancers and they want stuff too. So I have to think of both. But um, my primary focus has always been to design uh, clothing for bigger women. Like, that's always been my main focus. Um, it just doesn't happen to come out that way with how many different types of dancers that we have. So I try to get everybody. But um, I definitely want to answer some questions about, you know, if any of you have any questions about styling and... Um, how much harder it is to costume plus size dancers just in general because you'll find that um bras are not always something easy to fit um i have not bought a costume from egypt since 2005. i started to get costumes that were just terrible like the bras would fit but the sides would be so thin and i have like side boob i need like bras with appropriate sides like i keep spilling out of the sides of bras so i kind of started to think well i need to make some dresses where you can wear your own bra like i i spend like a hundred bucks on these great bras i can put a fancy dress over my own bra and have all of the jewels and the bling on top and still have my support unchanged so I included some photographs of dresses that I have done like that. And this confounds some dancers because they're like, oh my God, like it doesn't come with a bra. And it's like, no, you wear the one that's right for you and the dress comes over it. And that's been really, that's gone really well for a lot of people because they're able to remain secure or people will say that they have a scar they wanna hide or maybe they have, you know, an issue on one side of their body or some funky shape on the other. I don't, I've heard it all. Like I've literally heard it all. So those kinds of dresses have been really helpful because we can place the appliques and the designs in a way to um, distract from that. <clears throat> I've also done some costumes recently for male belly dancers and belly dancers in um, transitioning their gender and they have things that they also wanna hide. And so that's being kind of a really important trick too. So like Christine was mentioning the mesh dresses, like you can do that. You can even buy them, you know, from like lingerie shops, honestly, they like, if you're, if you're into making your own stuff, you can get sheer dresses online and then you can place, you can put them on your body and see, well, I want to hide this, this, and this, and this, and you can stick your jewels accordingly, you know, so that's a good, a good trick but I've been doing a lot of those um, but still regardless of what you do I think everyone should make their own costume so you know how hard it is and so that you'll willingly pay your seamstress what she asks <laughs> because it's not easy and then when you do it you time yourself time the time it took to go to the store to get the stuff keep all your seats, write down how much it costs to go back to the store to get the stuff because the other stuff didn't work. Time, all the time it took, the time that you messed up, the time you took it out, the time that you did it again, all the way from beginning to end, and your mileage, and then add it all up and you just find out how much you spent. 
but <laughs> make sure you pay yourself a living wage while you do it. And then you'll be like, oh my God, my homemade costumes from Michael's Crafts cost me $700 in the end. I wish I had just paid, do you know what I mean? So, but you should all do that if you're into making your own stuff, because you'll find out real fast that maybe you should spend the time checking out your body and deciding what you want to, you know, adjust so that you can effectively communicate to your seamstress what you want to do. So that's always my main bit of advice. Or you might surprise yourself and find out you have this amazing talent and you're a fantastic designer and you're really good and then, you know, we can compete. But um, <laughs> I think you should do that for sure. Um, so that's, those are my suggestions and my little lecture about it. But um, dancers of size and male dancers are in a tough spot because the market is flooded with cheap stuff and stuff that won't hold up well. And I can't tell you how many dancers bring me their $100 bed les and are like, can you fix it? <laughs> no, <laughs> we can't fix this for you. So, uh, I would challenge everyone to take a longer view of their costuming plans and like Christine and Tomlin showed you pictures of things that can be modified and changed. It's far better to spend real money on an amazing bed left that if you love that look, get the best you can and then, then spend less money on all the fun underdresses and potential skirts and drapey things that you can add later to make things look different. And it was also really nice to hear Christine talk about the troop issue because I have a lot of people come to me wanting troop costumes and I'm not the person to do troop costumes. It's just, troops never have any money. So I always suggest, you know, something like Christine was suggesting where you have like a base bed line and you go from there. Or I like the really like the stretchy red dresses with the cutouts you know, because something like that will look great on all of the dancers instead of just the skinny ones, which is, you know, always the complaint that I hear. So everybody should look uniform, but they don't always have to wear the same things. If you're, if you're a troop director who's committed to having people of all sizes, you can have them all in the same color red, for example, but with different designs you know maybe one person wants to show their stomach but the other person wants the whole dress like it doesn't matter as long as it's the same color and the same fabric sometimes that can work so um i guess let's see does anyone have any questions for me or want to look at some photos or let's look at some photos yeah let's look at photos okay so what should i put up first um, you can put up whatever you like. And we'll see. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to, I wanted to make a belly dance costume that could also be something really grand. Like I was thinking like Venice Carnival grand. And I bought gold fishnet. And it was gold sequin fishnet. And I had a very old, don't, nobody cry when I tell you this, but I had this very old belt from Madame Abla, like with 24 inch fringe. And the bra that the belt went with was long ago disintegrated and lost. Like we're talking, this was really old. And somebody gave me the belt and the belt was not really salvageable. So I removed all of the fringe and I put the fringe on that belt. So I made a complete, <laughs> I made a completely naked dress. So it was all gold sequin fishnet. And then I did jewels all over the bust area. And I wore my own bra underneath a nude. And I made a nude lycra fishtail skirt to go underneath. And then because the fabric was milled, and this is another problem plus size dancers have, because the fabric was milled only to be, um, 46 inches wide and I needed it to be 60 inches because of how tall I am and because of how much space I had to use around my hips. I had to cut the fabric to the, uh, the entire length I could get and then I added, it sort of was a blessing in disguise because I added rows of really wide sequin trim, like two inch wide sequin trim 
one in gold and one in turquoise. So this costume sort of came together um, in my mind as I was making it. And then I created a whole, I wanted to do like a whole Louis XIV Sun King thing. So I was going to a big uh, labyrinth. Yeah, I wish you could see the pictures a little bit bigger because this one has a whole sun hat. And then I took a, a, a crown workshop from Princess Farhana one very hot day in Hollywood. And she taught us about using aquarium tubing in our headpieces. So I bought this aquarium tubing and I put it in my headpiece and then you stick the feathers in the tubing. So when you travel, you're not traveling with the feathers out. The feathers go in the tube in like a paper towel roll tube or a gift wrap tube. And then you take them out and you stick them and you can arrange them and fluff them in. And I made a staff out of an old um, broom handle. But the whole thing was pretty over the top amazing. And I'll tell you, the thing that was so interesting was that when I wore it at the labyrinth, people were both initially surprised that a woman my size would be willing to be that naked in public. Even though I was completely covered, I had a nude bra on and a nude skirt and I was completely covered in gold sequins. And I had a really wide belt that completely covered my butt. I mean, there's nothing to see, but it gave the illusion that I looked like naked poured in gold. And um, people did a double take on that. And, um, it's interesting because I could tell that men really liked it, but also didn't feel like they should like it. So that was kind of like my first foray into naked dress, dress up dresses. And then I just sort of went crazy from there. But, um, and the next one, um, which is me, yeah, that one. I wish you could see that bigger too, because I was, watching like a lot of ice skating videos at the time and I think I watched um Blades of Glory a few times and I really like this like unitard look and and Jelena had done a few unitards at that time and I thought how do I get this unitard look in belly dance so I found the the mesh that I love the most that was really kind of sucked you in and I made a full-on bodysuit like legs and everything and the problem is that you find these bodysuits online and they all have a seam up the front like right up the torso which i find very distracting or they'll have a seam up the side um so you have seams along the sides of your body and the sides of your legs which i don't like that look at all so i spent all this time with like old 80s unitards um i have these patterns for like the old stirrup 80s unitards with the scoop out necks that you would put like the tank top underneath and I taped them together where I didn't want the seam and then opened them where I did want the seam and then created my own pattern so I could have a bodysuit with just one seam up the back it looks really strange when you lay it out like it honestly looks like you skinned a human like it's freaky but that's how I made the pattern and then I had this whole bodysuit and then I covered it with jewels and I decided which leg I wanted to come out and then I made a skirt to go over it. So the whole thing was incredibly lightweight, but I was completely covered because of the way that I covered it with the apple case. You couldn't see underwear or anything. And then I wore either a black bra underneath or a nude bra underneath. And so the whole dress is black mesh with pink, like dark pink and blue sequin apple case. And if anybody like wants to see details on the like you can just send me a private message on Facebook I'll send you pictures or send you the link so you can see the details and then there's like a more detailed one no uh, yeah there I am in the dress um that's pretty detailed and I love that one that one was really really fun and I felt like after I made that dress I felt like this is my plus size costume solution for my body because I'm so short I kind of need my legs to be covered in order to make the make me look taller but I don't want to no bathroom visit visits in this you go before everything <laughs> and um I needed something I like to use my leg a lot when I dance um and I do a lot of asymmetrical posing and twirling and I like to use veil and everything. So having like a full skirt without a slit kind of isn't good for me. So this is a way that I could cover up my leg 
and because um, I'm like really white, like snow white. So I kind of can be blinding in certain lights and everything shows up on me. So like any kind of like, if I get a cut or I have a varicose vein or like anything, it's really shockingly obvious. So instead of putting miles of bronzer on my body, like I used to do when I was gigging, I just did this and I loved it. And so now all of my costumes personally are going to be like this with the unitard underneath. So uh, that's my plan because I can also use the unitard later if I want to mix it with a different skirt. So that's kind of a mix to match. And then that also solved my problem of uh, costuming from male belly dancers too. So I kind of killed two birds with one stone on that. And then I have this one all the way to the left. Or, or Christine, you can just like scroll through whichever one you want. I can just talk about it, but um, yeah, that one. Okay, so I did that one for a plus size dancer in New Zealand. And um, I actually didn't really give you guys the best photo of this because the sides of the dress are open black mesh in a curved shape so that it curves up around her thigh and down. Um, so that it's narrower in the front and in the back. And I should have showed you a side view of that actually. But I did that on purpose because it gives her, um, it makes the waist look smaller and the hips come out more and it focuses on the midpoint of the thigh of the legs instead of um, like the butt area or lower. And I basically just covered it with, appliques made from the fabric and then lots of dangly sparkly big paillettes um, to show movement and I, I should have shown you guys photos of all these dancers in the photos but I feel really strongly about not doing any of that without permission um, in fact I don't even take photos from dancers in my costumes unless they've posted them to Facebook already um, publicly because I just kind of feel like everybody needs to have control over their photos which is why I have so many photos on dress forms if uh, if I was a skinny dancer I'd be modeling my own stuff and so that's kind of therein lies the problem as well so this dress I made for Vanessa of Cairo I made her a whole bunch of costumes but this one is the one that was the most successful and she told me that this is her costume that she wears at all the New Year's Eve gigs. And you can kind of see on this one, it has the same pattern as the last one. And it has a nude mesh stripe curved thigh cutouts on the side. The other one had black, but you couldn't really see it. But this one has nude. And the entire dress is the giant fire paillettes. And then I made the um, appliques come up. And I think she has a number of videos dancing in this dress on uh, her Facebook. So like that, it's a fun watch because that dress is fire. Um, and it was a great way to use up all kinds of scraps of chiffon because I had to make all different kinds of fiery looking ruffles. And that's another example of a dress that works well on all body types. And here's rhinestone covered. I did, I showed three different colors that I did of this one. And I do these dresses like in crystal, which weighs a lot, or honestly, a, like acrylic or resin rhinestones, which cuts down the weight um, and makes it a little bit more comfortable. And um, uh, the one that we're looking at right now, that nude one, I have made them, I've made maybe 10 of them and they've gone to all different places. One did go to a dancer in Seattle. I have one that I actually have two that went to dancers in Seattle, one that stayed in LA, one that went to Kansas, I think. I can't really keep track. Um, it's been like 600 costumes. Um, the stones are both affixed with glue for position and then and then they're stitched on top. So it's like a two-stage process that takes a little while. And then they're filled in with stones on top of it. Um, that's it in purple and I can vary the design according to what I want to do and what the person wants. So I've done a number of those and those are really fun. Um, and they look really great on and people tell me that they're able to wear undergarments depending on their feelings. I've had people wear full slips 
like spaghetti strap slips or even long sleeved opaque full on numbers for um, you know modesty and then some people who just want to wear a bra and you know boy shorts or a bra and a skirt i even had people tell me that they've gone completely naked with just the thong underneath so you know everyone does what they want to do and um let's see there's a there's okay that one that whichever okay that one that's one i made earlier this year which um had built in um like it had a bra and a belt but it also had this belly cover with this like faux lace up ladder work design. So that one gave a lot of coverage. That one was real popular and sold like that. Um, and I'll probably make more like that, but that's another good example of how you can get some belly coverage um, and also have something that's really sexy. Like, like a, real, a lar much larger person can wear that and still look totally hot and feel totally hot um, because some people <clears throat> really like to show their legs but they don't want to show their belly like all i'm i'm much more likely to show my legs than my belly and um and i also really want to look sexy when i dance i don't want to look like i'm wearing a tent like why do that so um that's a way i, I played with some design and that's this is another one in white where um I did this sort of winter green style, but I wanted to show that I made a bodysuit out of the same lace as the skirt. So it's really stretchy lace. And I did a cutout for the bra, but then when I got up to the shoulders, I made big, long, drippy, um, ballady wizard sleeves because I wanted it to look really romantic and soft. But this was for a dancer who was a little bit on the older side and really wanted everything to be covered. Um, but didn't want to be opaque. Like just because you're covered doesn't mean that you have to be opaque. That's something that I think people assume. Like uh, mesh and lace and things will cover a multitude of sins and also will make people uh, move their eye to someplace else. So that one I included. And then, and then there's this little one of me in the very center <laughs> in a full umbility dress. I found this fabric that looked like foa suits. So I made a bazillion of them and I've got my little shamadon on and I put red candles to match my dress. And as you can see, I like real, real high slits because I'm so short, not because I want to show my legs because I really don't, but I have to balance it. Um, otherwise my slits are like, they just, it just doesn't work proportionally. Um, and I did the hip scarf, I did a plain a suit hip scarf and it worked out really well. And that's one of my favorite dresses that I made. And that's like a simple, simple, easy dress with the flare in the back um, so that my butt looks a little more teardrop shaped and less wide because I sort of have that like pancake secretary spread. Like it's just like wide and flat. So I needed to have it kind of ready. So sometimes like, rounding the butt will look more like this if the skirt goes like that so that's what i did with that dress um so any questions about how how i do that <laughs> i mean it's not it's it's not magic but it also kind of is magic because it's trial and error for so long like I didn't just do that. Like, this isn't just like one year. Like I've been dancing since 2000. And I even remember like, I remember being a very beginning dancer and Tomalin, you were one of my muses. And I remember like at a class, my teacher would pop in the VHS. <laughs> like if you, were, if you got to class early, you were very smart because she would put a video in the, in the player at the dance studio and you could have 10 minutes to watch whoever she brought and i remember one of them was you tamlin and i was like totally smitten and like she'd bring in like little things of jelena and whoever and, and that's how i got to see all these things because like the internet was there but it wasn't there you know we didn't have video everywhere all the time so we didn't have smartphones so that's you know i would try to get to class early so i could see whoever whoever it was and then you know i would borrow the tapes and copy them and all this stuff. so but costuming like so i've been costuming since 2008 full-time like no other job so 
I feel like I've had like a lot of highs and I've had a lot of lows and I've had a lot of learning and in between. And like, I've literally met everyone and dealt with everyone in costumes, like almost everybody. So I feel like, um, I've really learned a lot about that from costuming different body types. And I still want to costume more plus size women all the time. Like that's, that's what I want to do because I like to make them feel beautiful. Like I really do. I like the way I feel when I put something on that I made and I feel really beautiful. It's easy to make the skinny girls look pretty. I'm sorry. It's just easy. And they can buy like 10 things and pick whatever out and it's good. But when you got body issues or some blockage in your mind about the way you look and a designer can make you feel fabulous, that's like the whole point for me. Um, so I hope to do more of that, but I just moved cross country. So I'm literally still putting my studio together. I honestly thought I'd be working like that, like right away. And like, I can't even find half my fabric and then like no one's dancing and it feels very weird. And, you know, I don't know, but I have a feeling next year we'll be all back to it. I hope, I hope so any questions? Also, you know, I just started this thing. I just started my Patreon and not, I'm not like trying to like plug my Patreon, but I did put something on there because people always want like design consultations. So I did put a tier on there. If you like want to make a costume with me, like you can get private stuff. So if you think of questions later or whatever, and you want to delve into that, just send me a message and, and I'm going to do like one-on-one -on -one Zoom uh, let's see what you're making and how to make it work for you consultations because like I can't I can answer one question but it's not going to be enough if you're in the middle of a project so that's that's that so just to be clear your patreon is for people who want to make their own costumes and have consultations right it is there's a section for that it's for other things but I made a section for that because people have asked me for um instruction in the past and i've done workshops and it's oh. never worked a video and i'm muted i think so i think that um if you're ready for consultation then take advantage of that because workshops are are kind of costume workshops are kind of a no because as soon as i start i'm like everybody let's thread your needle and people are like how do i do that and i'm like oh, okay <laughs> We're not gonna get very far today in two hours when I like have to teach that. So um, if you're already started it, this is, you can jump over and talk to me when you want and we'll work that out. So that's why I added that. So any questions? All you lovely muted people. Yeah, hi, I have a question. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Shravan from India. So yeah, when it comes to the fabric selection, so if if I wanted to choose the fabric which which always stretches, so is it okay if I choose non-stretchable fabric for my costumes, or is it to be or it should be always a stretchable fabric when I'm done? I think it depends on your level of expertise and what you want to make. Some people cannot handle stretch fabric um, because they don't have the right machine for it. Um, it doesn't always work with a plain sewing machine. You're going to need like a serger and a cover stitch machine. And that's kind of another level of sewing. So if that's not where you're at, you can, of course, always use wovens. It doesn't have to be stretchy stuff. Um, but I would encourage you to get some swatches and play around on your machine before you buy fabric because then, then you'll know, then you'll be able to match your expectations with your machinery and you won't waste money on something that's going to not work up for you. So there's no rule. You can have stretch or non-stretch or I've made costumes that are completely not stretchy and ones that stretch, you know, 15 inches. It just depends. Um, and it's two very different sewing ability categories. I had a question. Um, what do you suggest for hippier plus size 
women or just bodies. Um, when it comes, I found a good source for what to use for a bra, but what do you think for if you want to do a belt? What is a good um, mid-level to beginner sewing base that you would suggest for building on? Like a, like a struct, like as a structural base? Yes. Um, okay, so I use Easy Felt. And some people will cringe when I say that because felt is a non-woven. And so felt over time can change its shape. However, if you use Easy Felt, it's already pre-stiffened. So it's like, um, it's not quite as thick. It's not like as heavy as cardboard, but it's a little bit more like a, like a floppy hat, if that makes sense. So it's stiff enough to make shapes and to sew through, but it's not so stiff that it doesn't bend. And it's not so floppy that it's just fabric. And then on top of that, you can add things like, then I, you start to get into fusible bonding techniques, which is something that I'll probably do like a video on how to use fusible interfacing to add fabric to a backing so that um, your felt no longer does stretch. So it's sort of like imagine taking a fabric and then like rolling on a sticker paste and then putting another fabric on top, therefore bonding them together and then they don't move and they don't stretch. So that's a way that you can do it. Um, all those fancy Russian costumes you see with all the swirlies and the jewels and the, yeah, that's all fusible interfacing. And that's all it is. They've just created a fusible interfaced base and then they've cut their design into it using a cutting machine or scissors or whatever. So you can make your base out of the easy felt and adjust it accordingly and then fuse your fabric on top and then even sew through it at that point. So that's a way to do it if you want something with structure. As I know a bunch of people talk about like, recycle your old jeans and five layers of denim and okay, but it's still floppy, right? And you want something that will hold its shape. So I would experiment with that. And then also remember that you don't have to have a solid belt all the way around. Like I make belts sometimes where it's like solid stuff in the front and then wide elastic, more soft, solid stuff, wide elastic. You can create a belt that has some stretch. It doesn't have to be like the straight across style from the seventies or, you know, something like that. If that makes any sense, you can add stretchable elements. I'm so happy I asked. That was so helpful. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. And eventually I'll do videos on all of that stuff. It's just taken me a while to figure out how to make that work. So, any other questions? No? <laughs> okay. so maybe Darren, do you want to um, talk something about male costumes? Hello. Yeah, sure. I can talk about male costume. Um, it's Elizabeth. Uh, are you done? Or do you have something to add on? Okay. Anyone have any questions for Elizabeth? Okay. Um, we can go back to the questions to... later though, so don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Do you guys need to go to the bathroom or anything? Because you guys are on this, uh, <laughs> you guys have been on the screen for quite a fair bit of time. <laughs> so if you guys need to go to the bathroom, you guys can let me you know. We can have a short break and then Christine, do you have time for a short break? If they need to go to the washroom, do you guys need to go to the washroom? Um, okay. Um, all right then. Then I will just continue. Uh, all right. So, um, so it's very interesting to hear like there's a lot of things going on. Um, basically because a lot of the sharing are from women, and then suddenly a man is coming in to give in his input on costume. So, um, for me. I think for as a male dancer, the journey has been quite, it's very different because um, when I first started, my very first costume, oh dear Lord, I will cringe even talking about it, um, was a vest and a harem pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, my teacher decided to let me wear that on. And um, 
I mean, well, I don't blame her because that's the only thing we probably would know. And as and as I got longer in the experience of in in the belly dance scene, I I got to find out like um, there are other male belly dancers in the community, and one of which I really love the costume design is Horatio. Um, Horatio has beautiful costume, like beautiful. He's tall. He's masculine. Um, he's a ballerina. He's very good with theater staging and everything. So he's very good with the design of like the whole entire set, you know, how it looks like in his dance. So his costumes are all very, very beautiful. So that's the only reference I have had um, as uh, a reference for a male dancer in terms of costumes. So I didn't have any idea what kind of costumes to wear. I, I thought, you know, like if, if the women are wearing all the glitter and shine, glitter and glamour costumes, then maybe as a male dancer, I can have that. But I'm just wondering how I can have put that into my own style. So like any other one, like any other people, you know, they'll find a fastest way. I, I generally speaking, it may not be true for anybody, but um, I needed someone who was very familiar with working with men. But during the time, I think I'm talking about eight years ago, like during that time, there wasn't a lot of like costumer that I know who does male costumes. Um, I only do know of a few Russian dancers who live in Cairo or like, you know, they moved around on uh, different areas um, who does costumes, but it's a ballroom style um, costume. So it's very different from any uh, Egyptian style costume or any costume that has, or I would rather say quality. Because I know when I wear one, two times, the netting would like break off, it would snap off, it would tear off, beads would start falling off. So um, I know that that is probably not the best um, supplier to go to or the best customer to go to. So as I was in maybe like two, three years into the dance, so things started shifting. So my style changed, um, my conversation shifted in terms of the way how I look at dance. And therefore, things started to be a little bit different. So um, there's a few things that I feel a lot of um, a lot of people still don't really know a lot um, is that there is isn't a lot of studies on Oriental people. Like you know, um, Oriental people, it's like we don't have like big research on Asian people or people of uh, Oriental people. Basically, like there isn't a lot of studies about how you know, where they are from, what kind of heritage are they um, from. So because I'm a mixed heritage, I'm not like purely like Chinese Chinese. Um, I have like different blood groups in, in, my, in my ancestries. Like what I'm wearing now, it's like my heritage clothing as well. Um, so it's a mix of Indonesian with Chinese and Dutch-ish. So it's, it's a lot of like mixtures of things around in, in the whole region of Southeast Asia. So um, for me, how I design my costume is a lot based on materials because I am obsessed with cloth and whatever cloth I have left at home, I will as much as possible reuse them. Because it's come to a point whereby, okay, I'm done with selling, um, I'm, I'm done with going on stage wearing costume. And, and at the end of the, and on end of the day, you know, when I take off my, my costume, I'm like, oh my God, there's like, tears over here glittering all over my body I know it's part of the process but I didn't want to go through that you know the whole entire thing on me and so I came up with the idea like um, putting on materials on me wearing whatever I already have because of my background I studied um, contemporary and ballet before I more or less know how to mix a little bit that doesn't have got to do with um, glittery stuff so it's just very plain um, materials that I use. I'm going to show you a few of my favorite costumes, actually. And I'll, guide, I'll just explain and run through with you like um, how I got to do them or why I chose them. Okay, hold on a bit. Give me a minute. Okay, yeah. Could you all see? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, Christine's like laughing. Okay, so this is my favorite costume that I, I ordered on uh, a costumer from Egypt. 
It's a, hmm, <laughs> it's a ballady dress, Galabia. And what I like, really like about this is because it shows my legs and my chest. <laughs> I love showing my gams. Um, and I think that is, so I think for a male dancer, uh, I, it's important to understand, also know what are the parts in the body that you can really uh, stand out. Like some guys, they have very beautiful lines in their chest. They can expose the chest area without any problem. You know, like women, um, when they wear the, the, the top bra. So, okay, so I'm dealing with like a lot of ladies in my, my, in my group and I have to like supervise them, you know, like, okay, they would tell me, there and I would want big boobs. I'm going to push up, you know, and it's like, how am I going to do it? So they're like asking a guy, like, how am I going to do like cleavage and stuff like that? It's never like, okay, please ask Christine. So, <laughs> but um, this one is my favorite because number one, it looks like it's, there is fringes on it, but it's not fringes. It's just the material. It's just one plain material. And uh, she made a very nice uh, center um, exposed in the center line. And then, of course, the slit is slightly higher than the knees so that, you know, it, it shows a little bit of the gams. Okay, the next one. Okay, so this one, it's another one of my favorite, but it is very simple. This is like the most simple costume I ever, ever went. And this is the very t first time that I have decided to just use material and as any material that is as simple as possible, veil whatever there is around me and just wrap around me. So uh, this idea came from um, the Tamlin dress, actually. So because, you know, I've seen all the ladies, they wear the Tamlin dress and I'm like, okay, I need something that I can fit in. Like it gives me a straight cut. It shows my shoulder. It shows my arms. And so I told Christine one day, like, okay, um, I need to get something that it looks like a Tamlin dress. And she was like, I have an idea. And in, in Indonesia, they call this the gamis. And gamis is often worn by uh, Muslim women uh, as their outerwear. Or it's just as a lounge, lounge like comfort wear. Sometimes they do wear it as they go out as well. But this is as simple as it gets. And I'm like, and this is for women's style. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm... I'm very petite. I'm only like 160 centimeters tall. I'm not that big. So I am literally a kid size in the US, you know, like literally a kid size. So, you know, I have no problem fitting into it and I wanted to have more flow and doesn't make it look just one panel. And I decided to wrap around some veils around my neck and accentuate the hips a little bit more so that when I move, it shows my movement because I like to spin a lot and use a lot of extensions with my body. So the, the accentuation of the materials would help me with the flow. And, okay. Yes. Wait, so, um, uh, Darren, you had a question. Someone asked, I love the simplicity. Yeah. Is this for fusion style dance? Which, this one? Yeah. Is, okay. Um, I wouldn't consider this as fusion. Um, it's just... I did an oriental piece with this, but it wasn't with like a typical Middle Eastern music. It was, um, you know, it was like a, it's, how would I say? It's very interpretative. So it wasn't very like, you know, like oriental, oriental or fusion, fusion. Uh, I didn't want it. I just didn't, on that day, I just didn't want to bring like very heavy costumes. So I just decided to wear this, but somehow or rather it fits the dance though. So yeah, I hope that answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the next one, um, I like this costume a lot. It's, I call it the zebra costume, <laughs> black, white. Um, it's very simple and it's very exposed. Uh, as you can see that um, I'm wearing, you can see my boxers in there, which it shouldn't be. Um, it's a no-no in a dance world for men. It should be a dance belt, not a boxer. So oopsie daisy. So this is something that I really like because number one, it really um, show, it flows, especially when I do my shimmy, it flows, it has this little flows that ripple down um, to the ground. So this is my favorite. And so because one thing I work with the troupe, I don't like to have the troupe wear everything the same. Um, I like my, 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 my dancers to have their own style, to find their own identity along, along the way. 
so that <coughs> excuse me so that you know it, they don't have to feel like everything is by um it's it's not a forced kind of um design or costume that they have to wear so everything is really based on what their body allow them to wear how it shows their body and how comfortable they are in the costume so i would never want to force my dancer to wear something which they wouldn't want to wear um that's one thing that i would always do and i think that's maybe also because um uh um, maybe I'm a male dancer, so maybe the, my perspective for like women in their costume might be a little bit different. Uh, so that, that that's one thing that I like. I like to have a little bit of uh, here and there, a little bit of difference, so that people can tell that the dancers are who they are, and it's not like oh, it's Darren's copy or duplicate of Darren. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yes, we'll come to this one. So this one here, it's my Chinese calligraphy costume uh, this is the fusion this is a fusion piece uh, this is a mix of chinese dance with uh it's it's it, it goes around calligraphy so as you can see the top it's often okay so this top is very interesting i had excess materials from the pens that i did and i didn't know what to do and i decided to uh create a I don't know what we could, I don't know how we would call this in um, in English, like the top that it's around this way. I have, I wish I would have a better photo for you to see, but it's basically just like a, a cape. Yes, a cape. Exactly. It looks like a cape. It looks like a cape that goes around. Um, I'm just wondering why I cannot move my cursor around. But the cape creates the flow. So when I do a lot of barrel turns, so in Chinese dance, there is a lot of circular motion. Um, I'm not sure whether they call it the cocoon jacket, but uh, um, it's very oftenly used in Chinese. So Chinese people love chiffon material, uh, somehow or other, I don't know why. Um, I love chiffon material because it flows, it really flows and it's transparent. That's the thing, that's a beautiful thing, especially when you're doing in a theatre and when there's lights that shine on you, um, there is some silhouettes that hits onto your into the body so it shows a certain silhouette into the body like a hidden um like something is behind the material and and it's because of the flow so chinese dance there's a lot of circular motion a lot of circular movement they believe because this is the curve and it's called the chinese oh my god i'm going into the chinese um they call it i'm trying to i'm trying to translate it into my head um, form, they call it the form. Mm. The way how the dance is, they call it the form by moving it around, how well it's, uh, you can control the movement. So it's actually a circular cape. So it's not like a straight cut down or like a, a dark triangle, but it's a semicircle and it's a round uh, cape thing. Yeah. Okay, this one, I love this one a lot because it speaks of me head to toe. It's my favorite color, and it's also it also speaks of my um, heritage. So, I love the two color because it's Buddhism color. One is the saffron color, and the other one is the mustard color. Uh, and it means inner peace and um, groundedness. So these are the two colors that matches. And then there is the scarf that I'm wearing around me is a typical Balinese um, scarf which I bought from Bali and I was very tan then and I just came back from Bali. I was really very tan and I decided to, okay, you know, I think the color would fit me just perfectly well. I decided to just put on this scarf together with the rest of the colors uh, and it came out with this costume. And I really like this a lot because this one is very simple. I didn't have to um, think about you know, what's going to happen or what should I not add on and stuff like that. The only thing that maybe it could have been different is if I could add um, a little bit of um, glittery, glittery stuff, but it's still not me to add the glittery, glittery stuff. So the reason why I changed to th make it so simple, because um, at one point of time, I was, I was quite, you know, like I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Am I going to be staying in the belly dance oriented? You know, like, I find it, like, I don't know, so am I considered oriental, am I considered fusion, or am I considered other things, where am I? So I'm shifting in between the two different labels, and, you know, I find that if I'm donning on a 
oriented costume or a typical or stereotype um, belly dance costume, then I feel like I have to force myself to do something that is very oriental. Like, of course, it makes sense because you are representing a certain style and certain category. But I didn't want it to, I, I was done just being the product. You know, I didn't want to be just the product. I wanted to be the dancer and the being that people are watching and experiencing me. So it is not just going on stage and say, oh, okay, his costume is really beautiful. But I didn't want that to be the focus. I want that to be, oh, this is a very brilliant idea that everything that he has, the colors and everything, you know, the dance, the idea, the thing, the theme that he has fits perfectly for him. So this is exactly what I wanted the audience to see. Uh, is to see past uh, what I'm wearing outside. So, you know, so it's just more of who I am inside as a person, as a dancer. Yeah. And this one is the last recent one. Um, I like this one. This one was very last minute. Uh, I was panicking. I didn't know what to wear for a performance that was coming up. And but I wanted a costume that it was similar like that, but it was supposed to be black and gold. But um, the funny thing was when the designer did the original color, which was black and gold, it was so tight and I looked like I was a drag. Uh, okay, I cannot say, I, uh, but I was looking like a, like a guy going for a Miss Universe <laughs> pageant. It's so slim, you know, it was so tight at my waist and my hips. I felt like I was wearing a dress going for the Met Gala. And I decided to, you know, maybe uh, I have to tell her that this is a bit wrong. I need it to be a little bit white and it came back like that and it was perfect. I like this. So this is also a Galabia, but uh, I went without this. Uh, yeah, this one had a slit. But the only thing I added on was I wore a pants, slightly baggier, and it's made of jersey material. And then it accentuated my lower body a little bit more. So it didn't give me a very, um, that very you know, very compact and petite body size in the costume. Um, yeah, what to wear, it's, yeah, exactly. It's every question for every performer. So, um, so this is one of my favorite. I did this with the recent dance that I love so much and it fits perfectly for the dance. So for me, the way I chose costume as a male dancer, it comes a lot considering of the dance that I'm doing the music that I'm doing, the venue that I'm performing for, who am I performing for, and also are there lights involved? Because I'm, I'm one of those dancers that I prefer dancing on theater, in, in the theaters and on black box, um, just because I can get a little bit more creative and a little bit more eccentric with the things that I want to create. And so by keeping it simple um, and straightforward, this is something that I um, would like to just simply just stay with it. The next costume that I would really love to do is actually have uh, a, a batik style uh, costume, but I have to find a right material to put it on so that it doesn't look too stiff. So this is something that I can, um, yeah, I can invent, venture a little bit. So I think that's pretty much all for me. Is there any question you guys have regarding about male uh, dancer and their costuming? <laughs> it's kind of cute because I used to dance with Nat Keo. He's a Cambodian um, belly dancer living here in Victoria, BC. And so it, it was kind of cute because I remember being in his troupe and talking about costuming for men and him having costumes made and coordinating with, um, like he would usually create his costume ideas for what we were going to wear and then he'd coordinate his stuff so it's kind of, it, it was really fun to, to um see things from a, a the male perspective on how uh, we us women think that we're the only ones that have issues of, like what we need to how to proportion the costumes what colors suit us and um and i think actually it's probably actually a little bit harder for men because traditionally in the middle east the men don't perform unless it's more folkloric styles. So to kind of break into that performing in the sort of the Western world and coming up with the costumes, it's, um, I've really enjoyed listening to you explain your, your choices 
and you know talking about even just so you're saying that you're a smaller petite and how do you proportion that's that's so cool because us women think about that all the time <laughs> yeah but it's very interesting because like you know I had a few conversations with other male dancers as well before we have this pre- uh, we have this Zoom. I spoke to Alex, Alex Gunn and um, Rashid from Netherlands. And so the difference between three of us is that um, in, terms of, in terms of ethnicity, but because our body form is very, very different. Like for Rashid, he's super tall, beautiful, gorgeous face, gorgeous skin. Um, and very slender. So he wears costume. It really stands out on him because he's really tall. And for like Osgun, it's because he has a very middle age, um, a middle age, middle height, um, typical middle height. <laughs> Not middle age, sorry. A middle, a typical middle um, height for a man. Like he's between 1.7 to 1.8 ish. So he has, um, so it does show certain length in terms of if he's going to wear like a midriff costume or like a two-piece costume, like a vest and a, a tassel short, a pants. Because for Oxygen, his idea came from a lot from the Ottoman Empire period. And he uses also um, seasons um, idea. So like, for example, when it's winter, he has a winter, he has a winter design idea because he based on nature. So a lot of his ideas were based on nature. Um, Rashid is based a lot from Soak de Soleil and magazines. So um, these are these are like like I realized like you know I think for I think typically for Asian men, Southeast Asian men, we are not as tall as um, the Americans or the Westerns. So we are typically more smaller in frame. So wearing costume is a huge problem. So every single time when I get a costume done, it is sent to me at least twice the size bigger because they will never believe that I am actually 160 in height and very petite. They were like, are you, are you sure, Darren? Are you sure, Darren? So by the time when a costume comes to me, it's like, oh my God, this is just way too big for me to wear anything at all. I can't wear them. So that's why I stopped asking customers to do costumes for me. That's the particular reason because they just don't believe that I'm a kid size, you know, um, and they, they find it hard to believe, you know. And they just have to give me like extra additional size, which is, oh, way far, you know. Um, there's another dancer, which I really like a lot, um, Ryan from China. Ryan is like the male goddess man. For a, He's like this, he's like, an, he's like an ancient, he looks like an ancient China man, <laughs> a Chinese man who have like long hair, you know, with very nice silks and everything. I'm so jealous because he has long hair, you know, he's really tall. I'm just really short, you know, like really, really short. <laughs> I'm so short, you know, and it's very challenging because um, there is there is good and bad. The good thing is that I can fit easily into anything, even in women's clothing. And people wouldn't know that I'm wearing women's clothing because I'm that petite. And that's and that's the good thing about it, you know. Even or if I'm wearing a, a children um, pants, people wouldn't know either. Um, but um, there are also, <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. They, they, yeah, you know, they always think otherwise somehow. Like photos don't match the way we look in, in, in person. So there is a lot of different perception in terms of one doing the costume and the one, you know, asking to get the costume done. So uh, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, any other questions you guys have? I see that's a cool concept that you're just talking about our perceptions of what people look like in photographs or in in uh, videos but in a way that that's a testament to um you uh stage personality and performance because um when you're a performer you are an entertainer and you are perhaps um showcasing something that's yourself but also sometimes you're acting something different and when someone has this perception that you are larger than life um you've created something bigger than yourself so that's a very cool it's kind of a cool thing as well as like uh, you know like it's a problem because they're sending you like a costume that's not the right size but yes. yeah yes uh, i've got a comment before um once i performed on stage and when i came off the stage uh, this audience was like, I didn't know you're that small. 
<laughs> it's like I didn't know you were that small. <laughs> so this this kind of like gave me an idea, like you know. So really, I think even as an audience sitting now watching, the perception is very different because in school we were we as we study we were told that so in staging, um, there is a trick on the eye. Like the further you go into the stage, the smaller you become, and the and 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 the more you come towards the up front the stage, you become bigger in 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 the people's view of eyes. But it is just very funny, you know. Like even they can't see; they have no gauge, you know, to 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 testify whether you are that tall or you're that small. So I think that's really very interesting. Um, I have a very interesting question. Um, for Ishtar though, because we are on this um on this topic, like so for example for like. A male cost. Okay, so like from a male dancer who uh who is looking to do a costume, um, what is one of? Do you have any pain points, uh, for, or when you are doing, a costume for a male dancer? Like, what do you mean? Like, um, like, do you find yourself like okay because like, um, suddenly like, the body. You know the form of the body is very different. Like you have to consider the crotch area, and then you got to consider like the pits area that's a little bit different. Like you know, how is there any like difficulty for you doing that period of time? Or well, you just get a different pattern. You just right. get the male pattern. I mean, but so most of the male costuming that I've done has been for dancers who are transitioning. So I haven't had to adjust crotch areas. However, that's not like an issue. What it, whatever your crotch is is a non-issue because you can get a different pattern. The problem that I find where the fit is a problem is the shoulders because mm. men just generally have a broader shoulder base and the shoulders are just set differently. So um, it's uncomfortable that I have to ask like really like, questions that are none of my damn business but if i'm gonna dress somebody i often have to ask them like what what do they have going on you know are they are they transitioning or are they a male dancer who wants to look more feminine are they a um female dancer who wants to look more masculine i mean i don't know i have to get into these like sticky gender conversations but there's no reason why a designer can't have the patterns to fulfill the customer's wish regardless of what their body is, big or small. So if it means that you have to Frankenstein patterns together just because of what you have, that's fine. Like there mm. have been times where I've taken male bodysuits and then literally drafted them onto female bodysuit bottoms and vice versa because like whatever you have going on on your body is none of my business. So mm. I have to be able to accommodate that. So for me, it's shoulders that have been the hardest part. But mm. I mean, any designer who thinks anything is weird is like hasn't been designing for very long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I have seen everybody's boobs. I've seen everyone in their underwear. I've seen everybody's everything. <laughs> I get over that real quick and then learn to accommodate whatever everybody's got going on, you know? Mm. And some mm. women have giant shoulders too. So I've had to put male shoulder patterns onto, there's some dancers that are like linebackers. I mean, you just don't know. Mm. So. Wow. That's the only difference I have found is the shoulders. Right, right. But even then, like you were saying, if you're petite, it, then mm. it doesn't, then it doesn't matter anyways, because then you're going to probably use a women's shoulder curve. Mm. So. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or issues or something that they'd like to talk about? Thank you so much for even coming up with this idea to do this, uh, Christine, because um, it's been really, really fun to listen to the, the four different presenters and um, see your perspectives and ideas. And uh, yeah, it's been really great. Thank you so much. I really want to thank the panelists for, for taking the time to come and actually talk and collect the photos and everything. But the actual inspiration for doing this was because, okay, I saw a photo of quite a famous belly dancer and she's not overweight, but she was wearing a costume that made her look really big. I mean, just wasn't flattering. 
And then in my head, I was thinking, wow, if someone like who's famous can't find a costume that flatters her, then what about people who are just regular people? You know, how, we, how, how do we know, right? So then that came out, out with the idea. And I've never actually met Eshta before. So I'm really happy that you joined. Because it Thanks like, for oh, having hello. me. Hello. I'm and I'm, gl I'm glad that you're doing this because, you know, there are a lot of designers that are gone. Like, there aren't that many. I think in the USA, it's like me and maybe two other people. And that's like it. And the turnover in Egypt is happening really fast, too. Like, not just because of Corona, but just in general. Like, people aren't doing it as much. So everything is changing. So you're, it's really hard to even find designers. Mm. And like, there's a lot of designers in Europe now, but it can be hard to tell them apart. Or if you don't speak the language, you're not able to like get reviews too and find out who you're dealing with. So the whole thing has changed. So it's kind of important, I think, to chat with the people that are working in that industry so that you can have an open line of communication because there really aren't that many of us, yeah. like for real. And uh, I like the fact that you were saying that when you are a standard size, it really is you can just slap on anything and they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, but oh, yeah. the side boob with every single costume that I've ordered from Egypt, I've had to ask my tailor to change and like widen it to this much. Otherwise, mm -hmm. all of this armpit fat is going to come out. <laughs> and right. Course, well, they should know based on your rib cage and your general look what they need to do, but they don't. And I don't. I don't know what to tell you, but like, I can't tell you how many weird costumes I've had to change that have come from Egypt. And I don't know that it's a, a language issue. I think it's just a don't care because you're not going to return it issue. <laughs> I hate to say that because like I went and supported all these designs. I mean, I, Madame Nusa like grabbed my boobs like this and went, okay, I can make you a bra. I mean, and it was perfect. It was perfect. So there are, you know, there are these wonderful designers there, but I feel like they get sort of sucked into this stream of crap on eBay. So I feel like you really need to like find somebody who works well for your body and communicate with that person and then keep them as your bestie for a long term and like send them Christmas presents and hope they'll make you more costumes because there really aren't that many people. Well, I find like, for bigger girls that Madame Nusa is one of them, but I have mm -hmm. to use Alea as a translator because she doesn't speak much English. So I have to tell her, make them a little bit bigger, but then I also add more. And Hanan yeah. in Egypt, I think she's quite good for bigger girls too. Mm -hmm. She's quite mm -hmm. Hanan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, there are so many who want to make me costumes, but they all want me to look tall mm -hmm. and slim you know and when I dance you just can't see anything and then what's the point right. of dancing I'll just use that as yeah a down. so and like there's only I can only think of like one Russian designer that costumes for larger dancers oh. you know I think Fatima Habib is her name and then there's another Russian dancer who's larger I want to say her name is M Marie Habib I might be wrong I could probably find out but and she's gorgeous her stuff is amazing and I want to find out who her designer is but I mean like look at the designer and then look at who they've done and what they have in their portfolio and you better see bigger people or don't order mm -hmm. is how I feel yeah that's you true. know Hamilton, yeah. do you have any comments oh she's muted no I don't I mean, I'm amazed, like there's so much information and insights because we're all so different. And I really admire, Darren, what you're doing because, you know, it's been a problem. I've been watching over the years for the male dancers and sometimes things really don't work. And um, what you, the creations that you've done, they're they're really art you know they contribute to you as an artist instead of taking away and i imagine that journey must have been a hard one to figure out what works you know you talked a little bit about it because i know you started you were very young with the harem pants and the vest that i've seen so much of that and yeah i think men have to think out of the box but all of us do like there 
we all have to think for ourselves and find how we can express ourselves through our costuming. Yeah, and um, I also really enjoyed Eshta's presentation. Like, you are so glamorous and your work. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm just so excited to see all these male belly dancers. Like, it's a renaissance, really. And in a way, Darren, you sort of get to seize the day because you don't have as much baggage as the women do. You know, you don't have as many expectations. You can kind of go be forward thinking in your costuming, in your style. And it's just nice to see more men. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just good. It's good to see these other bodies, other people, other genders, other types. Um, cause belly dance was getting really boring and, uh, you'd get maybe one or two men at a festival and it was hard for them. I remember, I remember seeing how hard it was. So I think it's great that, um, that you're doing it and it's nice to see how you can create these looks without all this extra, you must do this, that, and the other that we all have that we learned from our teachers. You know, so in a way, embrace your freedom. You know, carpe diem for male belly dancers, really. <laughs> yeah. All and right. Christine, thank you so much <laughs> for doing it. I'm, I'm really, Thanks, I'm really happy. thank you everybody for joining. It was just an idea and I'm really happy that we could talk about it. It's, it is, I think that costuming makes the performance. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's just a sack of, a, a potato sack, not a sack of potato, a potato sack, but at least you've thought about it and you thought about how it's going to, to work on your body, how it's going to move, how it, how it contributes to your art and your dance. Um, I, I was telling somebody, I forgot who, that I actually, choreo sometimes I choreograph with a costume in mind, or sometimes I have a, cost a, a choreography and then I and then we make the costume to match with it. So I think that's really important because it shows our art. But I do want to share something about, um, you know, male dancers selecting some costumes as well. So like, I do know, like, um, there are like some male dancers who are like really concerned with their body. Um, I have a male dancer in my company who, who he has, um, who feels, uncomfortable with his body so sometimes um you know sometimes he do get um you know very insecure about the costumes that he chose uh, or that he has to wear or he's gonna like want to wear on stage and i myself i have body image issues as well right? i mean okay so you know i think it's a gay thing i'm not sure if it's true but it might be a gay thing that we tend to get a little bit more um self-conscious about the way how we look because like it's in a physical you know the gays are very physical people we like to see things in a very physical, th uh, we like to see physically, uh, you know, physical things. So it put a lot of pressure, especially when we are often told like, you know, um, our body should look a certain way. So choosing a certain costume, I have noticed this too. I did ask myself this question, like not wanting to go for like a little bit more different style of costume. Could it be because I was not comfortable with my body? So I do have narratives and conversations like this with myself sometimes, like, is it because of, you know, how the community has somehow conditioned or like have a certain um, structure of how male body should look like or male standard male body beauty should look, look like and therefore I should follow that that way of, of, of how it should look like, for example, have good six packs before I can even show my body or like, you know, or I should have a certain structure to the body even before I wear any costume. So I, I think, you know, as much as, as much as I, I know women has been going through a lot of this as well for the longest time, longest time. Um, I also do acknowledge that, you know, it is definitely very, very difficult, you know, for, for anyone who is, you know, who is putting the body out there, out in front of like, you know, you know, in the uh, audience or the public, especially it's something that it's very, this is using the body to move. And I don't just meant by, you know, oriented dance, because when I was doing ballet or modern dance, everyone was exactly the same thing. They were all feeling very insecure. Like ballerinas are the worst. They would often tell you cannot have big boobs you, because you cannot find your center. You cannot be on relevé. You have to be flat. If not, you cannot sustain. You cannot do your turns. You cannot jeté in the air. You cannot be lifted up by the guys. 
so there is a lot of like um you know um problems in the dance scene because there is always a certain way of how body should look like so i can only, i can really acknowledge i i mean i can really understand and acknowledge the fact that a lot of us do have this in all in us and choosing a costume is really you know it's really uh it's really a journey as well and i think what elizabeth I, is are you okay if i call you elizabeth yeah that's my muggle name yeah okay so it's like you know like when elizabeth said this in the beginning like you know a lot of dancers come to her and wanting to you know to have a quick fix to the body and it's very true like you know even if i'm not in that space to ask that question i have dancers coming in up to me and say i darren i don't have books how like i need to push this up more like can you give me an idea how to push this up more or who do i can i find a costumer who can make my suit bigger or like make my body look longer like the certain things i can't control you know so but what you say is true lah like you know be happy with the body that you have really because that's the only thing that is really going on stage and and that's the only thing that you're working with intimately when you're on stage nothing else but just you and your body and really just that because i i always feel like the audience know the moment if you're very uncomfortable they get to see it and they themselves feel the tension i've seen it before and i know that it's in your face you know so i i totally agree with that like you got to be very comfortable with yourself but it takes a lot of time to be comfortable you know, definitely when i was dancing uh, early on in my career people would laugh like i get on stage and people would laugh Mm-hmm. and i don't know what to do i mean that that was just threw me for a you know for a while and then mm-hmm. i like, okay you know fuck them all sorry excuse my french <laughs> f them all i you know i'm here to do something and to present myself and if you're going to laugh go ahead and laugh i don't care you're not part of my world and then just but it took a long time you know and then mm-hmm. you have people like some of my girls who aren't even that big they're probably like a size 10 us and we can't get gigs because these will say that oh they're too fat or they're too old or whatever mm-hmm. do you have any 18 year olds who are like size 0 45 kilos 90 pounds yeah like this and i'm just like what in you know i am not selling meat yeah you don't get to choose mm-hmm. filet mignon or sirloin <laughs> so mad a lot of us have had to decide that we're just not going to make money performing or be able to mm-hmm. gig and that's a tragedy in and of itself. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, I had to I decide think... a long time ago that I wasn't going to I reached a point, you know, I was like 25 and I wasn't getting any thinner and I it wasn't worth it to work that hard for pennies. So I had to just be like forget this professional thought that I had. It's gone. <laughs> That's an interesting thing you say Esther too because um when Christine was talking about like at the beginning of her dance um getting up and people laughing which is so cruel um but but you no know, we're never static nobody even if they mm-hmm. have like even if we look at them and think they have the perfect body nobody's actually static and people's bodies change over time um you know we all go through stages in our lives and it's learning to be comfortable like Darren said at any given time being comfortable in the body that we have mm-hmm. and i used to think the same thing as you Esther i mean i'm 56 now and i started belly dancing when i was 38 and i've only gotten bigger even despite the fact that i look after myself you know your skin changes um so many you know issue little issues arise that you didn't have when you were younger you know maybe you're not as flexible even though you keep working on that flexibility um and i i started getting to a point where i don't care anymore i i mm-hmm. realize i i have to be happy happy that i can dance for one thing and happy that i have something to offer i'm starting to understand more and more that i can't worry about whatever that image should be but that i do have something to offer and some of the most interesting people to watch on stage um are not always the famous ones they're not the youngest and the prettiest with the most expensive costumes sometimes it's it's um just somebody that is so comfortable in their own self that they're able to express 
their feeling for the music and that when you feel touched by that when you watch somebody and you feel moved in some way to happiness sadness you know uh, mischievous whatever they bring to it that's the mark of a performer and it doesn't have anything to do with age or size or um disability you know like I, i've seen i've seen a few dancers that don't have an arm and mm. they were still beautiful to watch because they they took me somewhere well i think you have to remember that you're the audience right like are you the audience or not like do you want to go and see dancers or not so if you're the audience, you get to look at what you want to look at. And I don't, True. I want to look at big bodies, but that's just me. That's not everybody else. So I'm always the one who will march up to the manager at the restaurant and be like, who's your dancer? Well, I want a bigger dancer. And I'll tell them like, hire a bigger body or a more diverse person and I'll come to your restaurant. But I'm not going to watch Little Miss Hostess in the Turkish special, you know, and pay $60 for dinner to see something that's not up to the level that I want to see. But that's just me. Like that sounds mean. And maybe like not everybody wants to do that, but I've always been that way. And so if you're the audience, you see what you want to see, put that in your feed, support those dancers. If you're in a position to make a zoom panel or a, a show, get those people in the headline positions that's what you have to do sort of like voting like you have to see what you want to see and if you aren't if you don't if you don't tell the people who are in power then you're gonna see the same thing over and over again and honestly i'm so tired like i don't miss any of the festivals i vended at the mall and i all i saw was the same cookie cutter over and over and over again the same skinny girl and the same bella doing the same thing and i just was tired of it and I remember belly dance differently. I remember seeing women in all types of bodies and times in their lives and what they could share. I mean, not that I didn't see some horrible stuff too. Like that doesn't mean that bad dancing is okay, but you know, it was wonderful to see all these different people and I miss that. So that's what I wanna see and that's what I'm gonna see. That's what I'm gonna put in my eye holes with the time that I have on this planet. So I guess you got to decide if you're the audience or not. Maybe we have to work harder as audiences, I guess my point. Yeah, yeah that's a very interesting percept, um, um, point of view because I think it does make sense in that way as well. Because um, even as dancers ourselves, we can be as equally hushed, but we don't know them. We don't know it. Like subconsciously, we can be as hushed, even though we don't think so. So um yeah it's like you know if we are putting on the lens as an audience we also got to be mindful about what we are seeing with our eyes and and that's mm -hmm. very because it's a reflection of the way how we would you know make decision based on what we want to see where what we choose to go or where we choose to go and watch the shows mm -hmm. or who yeah. we're gonna call to be on stage so it's very true so i think it works both ways as well even as a performer and as an audience it needs to be it needs to have a mindful practice that you know, that it has got to be a conscious um, way of making that choice. You know, it's either you are aware that this is happening or it's either you just don't do anything about it. So you got to make one decision, but somehow or other, a decision has got to be made. I mean, do you really want the 20 something year old guy who owns the hookah lounge to decide what you get to see in the belly dance world? No, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't care what his opinion yeah. is. I, I'm the dancer. The person mm. who's now buying the dance videos and the video, you know, the instructional videos and doing that, I get to say who I want to see. Yep. So, so. <sighs> and then that means that we need more larger people. And I feel bad saying that because I don't do this myself, but we need more larger people to model costumes and to put out instructional videos. We need more male dancers to step up and do all of that because if we're also not doing that, like I, I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to tape myself. I look so fat, but I have to banish that because if more people see me, then I'm doing my job. So that's my, my cross to bear. And I don't know if I'll get past that, but I'm going to try. I, I think that for, for, for me personally, it's really scary though. I mean, I get so scary. many 
really nasty comments on my videos and stuff and, and I'm not even famous I, and I don't really post that much either um, and then students don't want to learn because my shape is quite straight I don't have a waist I have a stomach I'm like the Michelin man okay so I have a stomach and you know and the, the waist to hip ratio is not there so it takes a lot of effort for people to actually see what I'm doing right. and beginners me too help. yeah me too yeah, but same height. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what to tell you except let's turn off the comments on YouTube and, yeah. you know, Camelin. Oh, Bobby just posted. You are more famous than you think. It's true, Christine. You are actually getting a bit famous. Yeah. Both <laughs> good. Yeah, you good. You should be famous. I, I, yeah, I did. She famous. Christine, I think you're amazing. I'm a new fan girl. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I don't think it's the fame. It's that I just want to touch people. Not touch people, but like I would just want to touch people emotionally with, with what I have to offer. And I feel like it's um it's not just about looking sexy and looking hot, especially in this dance form. There's so many things that is 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 it's from the inside out that that's what I feel. And I'm really actually, you know, I come from Miami Beach right before, and that is such an appearance oriented. Well, Miami and Miami Beach, it's all about the beautiful people, right? Mm -hmm. So there was so much pressure. And in my dance company, I did diversify like, I, okay, in South Beach, it wasn't about race at all. Like that, I mean, if I had black dancers, mostly Hispanic dancers, a few white dancers and so forth, not a lot of Asians in Miami, but um, that was never an issue. And I wouldn't have allowed it to become an issue either. But, but when it came to size and age, sometimes people were brutal. Even in theater shows, I would get like these ter terrible, they were, they were terrible about it, you know, and it was really hurtful to some of the dancers. So I remember one dancer, she was bigger and she kept dieting, trying to be smaller and trying to fit. And finally, I just told her, listen, you have a role. You can lead people, you can open consciousness. It's going to be a lot harder for you than it is for somebody else because, you know, you can but you're in a position to really do something and make a mark, mm. you know. Um, and she actually did. She brought the dance to Cuba. She made a film. She's she does all kinds of of um, educational, interesting things that have so much more depth. And if she had just kept trying to fit into that mold that that was expected, she wouldn't have done all these incredible things that she's done. I don't know if you've heard of Havana Habibi, but um, yeah, Tiffany Hanan, she, she did this huge project and she continues doing things. So um, I think people that are not fitting the mold actually have more work ahead of them, but can do greater things too. Yeah. And with me, it's been interesting because I've come from that Miami Beach scene and actually it's, you know, at a younger age, I fit into that um, stereotype and then to get older and keep dancing is really an interesting process because, you know, you have something, you fit and then you don't fit anymore and it's it's fascinating. I, I actually feel better about myself now than I did back then because less objectified and, and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say one other thing too? I just recently watched um, Dr. Mo Gadawi, Randa mm -hmm. Kamal and Mohammed Shaheen a couple of days ago did a live Facebook and Instagram um, question and answer and they were talking about the difference between folklore and oriental 
but the the one of the really wonderful things that came out of that discussion because i couldn't watch it live i watched it later is that they made the point that you don't have to be egyptian or of the of the <clears throat> countries of origin to be a great dancer and in fact muhammad said he said he goes there's some dancers that are better than we are that are not egyptian and they never once talked about age shape ethnicity what they did talk about was the, lots of the things that you, all of you people here particularly especially if you've been around for a while like christine saying well i'm not famous is the promotion of the 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 dance itself the art um the respect you know and, and bringing it like tamla mentioned like bringing it to, um because over there of course we know that the dance has very uh, mixed connotations but how um they want to see that elevation of the dance the respect for it they also talked about the fact that it's nothing it has nothing to do with how much of your body that is seen it's more about what you can do with your body and mm. so they didn't talk about size or shape and i thought that was just so wonderful to hear from those people all they were asking for is respect it respect it work within the lines of what oriental dance is um, but the rest of it, it's hard work and bringing, and they talked about feeling, bringing that feeling to the, to the dance. So I thought that was wonderful, especially considering we've just been talking a bit, focused a bit more about the look and how we dress. Um, but it, that's, that's good because it adds to the overall package. Um, but it's, it's what you bring to the table initially. That's the most important element. I really hate those costumes where you see almost the whole crotch, you know, where it's cut up so high until the waist and you almost see the crotch and it just distracts me because I'm like, what am I supposed to see her dancing or am I supposed to wait until she flashes me? You know, this is what I'm looking at. This is what I'm looking at. And I'm a girl, you know, I'm, I'm you know, so it's like, what, what's going on? Sorry, so I, I can imagine how- It's okay, I hate the giant long skirts because yeah. that are like four inches too long because I spend the whole time thinking someone's gonna trip and fall. And I almost want them to, because that might be more interesting. <laughs> Sorry, but I hate that look, it's the worst. <laughs> we all, yeah. There's a lot of trends these days that some of us love and some of us don't. The garter belt trend. Oh, God. Yeah, and for me, it's not it's not my cup of tea. But okay. Um, any other comments or sharing that you'd like to? I, I'm so happy that it went from costuming to like body body image discussion. I think it's really great. <laughs> okay, so um, back to Ashta wants people in long skirts to trip. <laughs> Don't I just when they're so but long just, and they're too really short really and then they're four inches this. longer? You know the ones I'm talking about. I know. I've hated them because I saw them and I love the the cut, but I don't want the length because I will die. I'm but I mean, there's a there's a legit bada de cola flamenco style skirt where you learn to dance with this length, and it's part of the dance. That's that's a different thing. That's but. What that's not what I'm talking about. This whole, like, my skirt is four inches too long, and I just, I'm just looking at it, and I'm like, fall over, just. <laughs> I you just want to end the color. trend because everyone will sprain their ankle, and then it'll be over and never see it again. <laughs> when because I... that's, that's the problem with the, when the costuming is wrong, the audience is focusing on, am I going to see your underwear? Are you going to fall? Is your bra going to fall off? Like, and then that's all you see, and then you never saw the dance. Then what I, dance happened? I don't remember a dance. I just remember thinking she was gonna fall on her face or her bra was gonna fall off. Like I have full on seen titty on stage come out. And that's all I've thought about the whole show. We had a, pr I watched- you know? That's I bad watched, costuming. No, you're right. Because I watched a performer and it got to the point she didn't judge that she was on a riser above the audience and we were trying to figure out if she had knickers on or if she had a g-string because either way we were waiting for a full um complete visual because mm -hmm. her costuming was not appropriate for a raised platform stage yeah. 
<laughs> and yeah. I couldn't tell you what she danced to, what her music was, what her costume color. I couldn't tell you a single thing except for we're like, are we going to see just her butt or are we going to see like everything the doctor sees? Yeah. Which is That's not bad costume. what you should leave your audience thinking. <laughs> But a lot of people, they really are, it, costuming is, is something that takes time to understand mm -hmm. because I've known people that, like there was one dancer and she was my student. She was a very, very well-dressed woman. But when she did a show at our a little studio show, and then I noticed, oh my God, she has a G-string and she has a chiffon circle skirt over it. We can see, you know, like you said, we can see everything, but she had no idea because a lot of people don't understand about fabrics and realize how sheer chiffon is. So as teachers, especially, we really have to check our students before they perform. Mm -hmm. And in the early days when I would work in China, you know, I was doing a month long workshop for 10 years and um, the, the first maybe three years when the dance was new to China and a lot of the commercial, you know, just being able to buy anything and everything was consumerism was fairly new at that time. So people were just buying all kinds of stuff, sparkly stuff and having stuff made, but not really aware of how to put this all together. And there was a <laughs> lot of sheer, like sheer dresses without the proper undergarments and they even opposite, like, let's say a polka dotted bra under a sheer dress and not realizing that the bra was going to show. And it's logical. It's a skill people have to learn. Mm -hmm. So they don't know, they don't know how it looks. So they don't know that it's, that it's not right. And now that you order on the internet too. Oh, one thing I do have to say, very important, try on your costumes and practice with them before you go out in public, because I would see people, and this again is in China, I would see them, you know, they just get their outfit that they ordered on the internet just mm -hmm. to do their show. And of course, the skirt too long, they hook it, they don't pin it, you're, you know, one of the hooks comes open, all kinds of horrible things are, you know, ready to happen with that. So you have to, the it has to look like it was tailored to your body. Even if you bought it on the internet, you have to dance in it, adjust it, figure out how it's going to, how it's going to work for you. Cause, oh my gosh. Yeah. I talked about that, you know, earlier. It's just like, you can see all kinds of stuff you don't want to see and, and just be like who wears clothes that don't fit them. Do they, we walk down the street wearing clothes that don't fit us? Yeah, but, big people do sometimes because we can't find anything. But you oh. know, I get so many free shows. You know how many free shows I've had from famous dancers? I get all the free shows because when they come over to get their costume, we put it on and then I make them dance for me. And I put on whatever and I'm like, you have to do the whole song, the whole thing. I mean, part of it is like sneaky because I get a free show, but they have to do the whole dance in my living room because how else will I know if something's going to fall off? Like take right. it home and have to fall off there? No, it falls off in my living room so that I can fix it for you. They're lucky and, to have you. <laughs> and they do it. They dance and then I get like a whole free <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we find problems. You know, you find out that when you raise your arms, something doesn't work and then you got to take care of it right then. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That then's the rules at my house anyways. <laughs> Good. So. Yeah, for sure. And I tell them when I mail them, I'm like, when you get it, you better wear it first. Dance around, do your whole thing, get on the floor, ceiling, whatever you're doing, and then tell me later. Yeah. Well, thank you, Christine. I really appreciate that you um, asked me to do this with everyone, and it was nice to hear everyone's perspectives and I've been design a challenges and such. For a long time. Well, thank you. And I saw it live, and when I watched Vanessa in Cairo, I was mm. like, "Who made that dress?" <laughs> she was like, I I, "Can I, you know?" I was like watching her like this, watching that dress, that flaming red and yellow. Oh my god, it was mm -hmm. so amazing. So yeah, that's why I was like, "Oh yeah, 
I have to go find who this Ashton is. Because <laughs> I, I yeah, need, um, it's a sweetheart. You know, she yeah, and she has really beautiful costumes, and I think that she really credits her name, which is good. Mm hmm. Yeah. She knows a lot about her body. She's a dancer who knows a lot about her body. Yeah, I'm so, sure. That's good. Okay, so I think we should um, finish the the session. Thank you all for joining. I took. Uh, can I take a screenshot if that's all right with everyone? I know that we, lots of people have what, left, but anyway, we are we are the troopers. <laughs> Christine Tamley wanted to say something just now. Oh, oh, I just really quick with, with my troop when I had a troop in Miami and we would do these shows. I would bring along a roll of sequins, and then you know how the straps can kind of kind of be loose and then then your top part doesn't fit that well and i would have everybody tie their straps with the mm -hmm. sequins and then we just cut off the sequins afterwards and throw them away but well that was something really practical that helped a lot with the fit of the bras mm. was it like a sequin ribbon yeah oh yeah it's a single single sequin and it comes on a roll and they're not expensive that roll even with a whole troop will last a long time mm. and yeah, i get I oh, yeah. silver and gold mm. that's a good hack yeah yeah <laughs> i just started building all mine on bikini tops wired bikini tops are great for huge busted women great <laughs> <laughs> okay so i'm just going to take a quick screenshot let me see and one two anybody else want to join uri one girl okay okay ready one two three <laughs> thank you very much everyone for joining thank you for the panelists i i really appreciate thank you really wonderful um Thanks. i will post it up on youtube and for anyone who missed it or something or if you want to share it it's up to you okay yeah Thanks. send me the link because many yeah. people were asking Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and good okay. morning to you guys all in the States and good night to us in Asia. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.